Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Um, we're excited to have another Gentry community events today. Um, so we really appreciate everybody's attendance. Today, we're gonna discuss how to build a data mesh using Gen3. Uh, my name is Michael Fitzsimons. I'm the Director of Research Programs and Outreach at the Center for Translational Data Science at the University of Chicago. Um, some other sponsors of the event uh, are NESI, the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure, the Australian BioCommons, and the Open Commons Consortium. We also have um, speakers or a speaker from the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Chicago today. Um, just a little housekeeping. Um, you are being recorded. Um, so um, we may post this later or we will post this later online. Um, we'll also share the slides with everybody um, after the fact. Um, typically, um, we're going to hold the questions till the end. It's up to ind individual speakers if you want to field a, a question or two um, as we go along. But in general, we're going to hold till the end. So feel free to put your questions in chat. Or at the end, you can um, raise your hand to unmute. In general, please, everybody should, um, except for the speaker, remain muted throughout the presentation. Um, so with that, um, next slide, I'll give you the brief agenda, and then we'll kick it off. So the agenda today, uh, first, we'll have an introduction to Gen3 data meshes by um, Bob Grossman, who's the director of CTDS at UChicago. Then we will hear from Phil Schum who's um, part of the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Chicago, who will be talking about the HEAL data mesh. Um, so basically the format is introduction to use cases. So HEAL data mesh, and then the biomedical research hub, um, which RT Venkat is going to speak about. Then you'll hear um, a little more detail of how to set up a commons um, using Gen3. Um, that'll be by Sai and Naramanchi. Um, and then we're gonna have some time for open discussion and then Finally, we'll have um, a few minutes to discuss topics for the next event. So um, for all the speakers, please introduce yourself um, when you start, but I'll pass the baton on to Bob to tell us about um, data meshes generally. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I wanna extend my personal welcome to everyone um, coming to this Gen3 community forum. We have these about every other month. If you have a particular topic you're interested in, please let us know. Um, we want the community forum to represent all the community activities anywhere they are. And uh, we particularly want to support sort of relationships that can build um, between um, different members out there building Gen 3 Commons, as well as, um, you know, um, relationships between those people out in the community building Commons and the um, uh, different people at some of the uh, the core groups uh, building Gen 3. Um, every month or so, I hear about new Gen 3 Commons, so um, uh, I, I hope we can get them all coming to the community forum. Next slide. I'm going to give a, a, a pretty high level conceptual talk of what a data ecosystem is, what a data mesh is, and when you want to build, you know, how to decide if you should build a commons or a mesh. So I have just a few slides on what a data mesh is, um, and I'll use the term data mesh and data ecosystem simultaneously. Um, different communities use diff, uh, use these different ways. Um, data mesh is also used for um, a, a slightly more general uh, 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 enterprise uh, cloud and distributed computing infrastructure. I'm going to use it in a much more narrow sense. So um, next slide. So, What's the what's what's the main reason you have a data mesh? The main reason is if you have multiple data commons and, and multiple data commons with other resources, they could be data repositories, they could be computational resources, they could be knowledge bases, they could be other cloud-based resources, and you want to interoperate them. So um, 
When you have multiple resources and you want to interoperate them, that's where a mesh comes in. These could be resources your organization runs, resources that run by organizations that partner with your organization, or um, third-party organizations that your organization is supporting. And they're different use cases. Um, and um, uh, uh, we'll go through some of them here. Next slide. So, um, you know, there have been multiple attempts to build out an ecosystem. Um, one was the um, NIH um, uh, uh, cloud, I can't remember the name, but they tried to build out an ecosystem. And the approach they took was to um, basically define com components and define interfaces for the components and get interoperability uh, through these components. And that's a reasonable way to proceed. Um, the, it, it can be tricky to do that, especially across different organizations. And our approach in Gen 3, and you know, I've, I talk about this fairly, fairly, uh, um, fairly often now, but it's the end-to-end -end, uh, approach to complex systems design. It's the way the internet is done. It's the fact that the internet runs on a very small number of services, TCP, UDP, um, uh, DNS, a few other services, and we can add new sources of data, we could add new um, end systems, and we don't change any of these uh, uh, services. So um, we, we've been calling these framework services. It's how we build the Gen 3 Commons, but it's more importantly how we build uh, both uh, how do we build data ecosystems? Uh, in this context, we some we call them both framework services and mesh services. And the key question is, what are the fewest number of services that can support the interoperability of data commons? Um, these are the mesh services. These are like Fence, IndexD, the Gen3 metadata service, uh, a few others. And the key idea here is we don't try to specify, you know, in the GA4GH standard, um, complex stacks and um, required components, et cetera, but it's really what are the fewest services that we can use to support um, uh, different components. And the reason this is important is um, if you think five years, 10 years, um, everything changes, but if you choose this right, the, these, these, um, um, these mesh services won't. Um, we've sometimes called this the narrow middle design. Next slide. So what's so uh, what's how do you think of commons versus meshes? Next slide. So at, at a high level, uh, I mean this is very obvious, but I want to emphasize this. Um, a, a data commons is you have multiple projects and they're within one discipline, and I want to. Th these are at least Gen three commons. I want to. I'm willing to curate and harmonize the data. And I want to make it available for the research community. Um, I, and um, how do I do that? And so the assumption here is we have a common data model. The data is curated and harmonized, and it's valuable and will be made available to the research community. The, a data ecosystem is um, I have multiple cloud-based platforms, data commons, data repositories, uh, uh, computing resources, and I want to search for relevant data compute with it, explore it, analyze it, and share it. It's here the key issue is I have multiple cloud-based resources I want to interoperate. So the first generation of data meshes is the, the data meshes we built for the Cancer Research Data Commons to interoperate the cloud platforms and the multiple commons, um, the architecture of BioData Catalyst. And we now have second generation data meshes um, and these are also designed so that commons can be added to them very simply. Uh, here, the assumptions are there are multiple data models, but standard APIs for the mesh services for um, authentication and authorization and data access. Um, and typically, but not always, data will be accessed at the data set level or the data object level. So there's an um, so we have multiple models. 
and access is at the data set, project, or data object level. Um, you could query, uh, uh, do, well, th that's the basic assumptions. There, there are lots of variants. Next slide. So um, to add something to a, a, a Gen 3 data mesh, you expose a, um, a, a, a data access API, uh, Auth N, all Z API, and metadata API. These all have, uh, uh, well, uh, Visa passports for GA4, GH work for the uh, the middle, Auth N, all Z. Uh, we could use DRS um, or um, other uh, services at GA4, GH. It doesn't quite have a metadata service. Um, data Connect can, can be used, and the uh, Gen 3 metadata service will become compatible with Data Connect. But um, there are also services if you have for um, if you have um, SQL or GraphBase or other uh, data uh, uh, APIs for structured data. But these are the core services, um, and um, this is all you need to do. And um, if this will make it very easy to add a, a, a platform to, to a, a mesh. And so we really want to make it easy to add repositories and um, commons to meshes. Um, at a high level, a commons has a, a structured data. Here I have a graph DB, but Gen3 also uses OMOP and has fire support. Um, and you have an explorer, which you can pull out uh, anything in that graph database or OMOP database. And a mesh um, is built over framework services and data sets and metadata um, or objects and lakes and, and their metadata. Um, so these are somewhat different. Um, and uh, the one on the right contains multiple items like the one on the left. Um, that's at a high level what's going on. It's importantly, they're all built on the same core set of framework services. So if your organization sets up these framework services, you could have a mesh. Or if you have a commons, you want to add it to a mesh, you could add it to multiple meshes by interoperating with their framework services. Next slide. Um, this is just for the handout. I, I define everything on one page uh, because I, I like one page definitions of everything. It makes me happy. Next slide. Uh, historically, you know, we've, we, we had these first generation messes, um, starting around 18, 2018 to 20, our second generation meshes have been the last couple of years. Um, we, we will be the, the, the GDC front end framework will be coming out and a gen three front end framework will be coming out about six months after that. So that will make it much easier for you to. Um, improve your Gen 3 front end. And so on the right is how we are, we're thinking of our, our current architecture now. Next slide. Uh, just a slide or two about um, security and compliance. We put a boundary which exposes APIs around each of the resources. Either uh, each organization has their security and compliance boundary around their commons or repository or cloud resource. And then um, there's a security boundary um, around the mesh services, which each of these can use, or they could have their own mesh services. Um, they just need to expose the APIs. And then for workspaces and um, bound for, and, and um, container-based workflow services, everything else, there's an API around that, um, as is ar around the portals, and other things that are part of the um, of the ecosystem, and um, it, it may seem a little complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Uh, the the um, each resource in the mesh, um, whether it's a commons or repository or a computing resource, uh, has its own security compliance and governance. There's shared governance around the. Um, uh, what connects into the mesh and how you use the the mesh services. And then when you bring up uh, uh, components within the ecosystem, it has its own security boundary. Next slide. And the, uh, I mentioned the governance model. Each resource ha has governance. The, me the mesh itself has governance to decide what to come in, 
and then there's shared governance around how you're going to um, uh, which mesh services you use and who you connect to with those mesh services. Next slide. Um, um, people are going to give examples, but um, I'm just going to flash these on to introduce you. Next slide. Artie's going to introduce you to our second generation mesh, the biomedical research hub. Um, and next slide. Phil will introduce you to our second generation heal data platform or heal platform, heal data platform, which is a Gen 3 mesh for the NIH heal initiative, which spans um, uh, has to man uh, includes hundreds of programs and in multiple repositories by multiple organizations. And I want to emphasize that you can build meshes um, that are sort of uh, share, just share a few organizations, or you could build meshes like um, uh, the um, HEAL, which um, um, covers many organizations. Um, it's just how you build it, and um, it's up to you. Next slide. Um, I, I have time for, I think, one one or two quick questions, if we have one or two quick questions, and then there'll be time at the end. Any quick questions? Okay. Uh, uh, meshes aren't hard to build, especially with our new Helm charts. Um, and you know, to make them easier, sometimes there's an expression: nothing is, you know, nothing is hard if you get other people to do it, and you can try to convince other people to bring up your mesh so your organization can add as many comments as they want. So um, I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Um, Phil, that's you. So feel free to kick off the presentation. Thank you. you. Can see my screen, okay? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Bob. Uh, my name is Phil Schum. Um, I'm a statistician in the Department of Public Health Sciences at the University of Chicago. Uh, and um, I have worked with Bob in the past building data commons for different projects. Uh, and so what I'm describing today is our work on uh, what we call the Heal Data Platform or Heal Data Mesh. Um, and uh, I, I, I acknowledge Bob here, uh, but this really is the work of a, of a large team at CTDS. Um, so everything I present, the credit really goes goes to them. Uh, so very briefly, if you're unfamiliar with HEAL, uh, HEAL is a, a trans agency effort uh, on the part of NIH uh, to address the uh, opioid crisis in the U.S. Uh, currently consists of over 800 NIH-funded studies, um, some extremely large, some national studies, uh, within two broad areas. The first is in improving the prevention and treatment for opioid use disorder uh, and addiction. And the second is uh, basic and clinical translational research in uh, improving pain management. Uh, and the key thing to know here is that uh, NIH is through the, the leadership of, of uh, Rebecca um, uh, and 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 the other folks in the in the office of the director have had a very strong data sharing mandate from the beginning, and so uh, a lot of the heal programs, networks, and so forth uh, were conceived with very strong um, uh, data sharing uh, efforts in mind. Um, the heal. Uh, Heal, heal is, is extremely broad, uh, you know, even within those two areas that I described. Uh, it goes all the way from, from bench to bedside um, and collects, as you can see here, uh, more than 20 different data types. Um, so the rationale for a data mesh in the case of HEAL um, as I just pointed out, extremely broad range of disciplines. Um, study designs and data types really favor uh, specialized repositories. Um, 
uh, in, in many cases, the investigators are used to using them and, and they're well suited for the data. And so, you know, that, that makes a lot more sense than some kind of monolithic structure to encompass those. Second is that NIH had a strong desire to reuse existing resources uh, for maintainability and, 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 and so forth, um, sustainability, I should say. Um, and, and not only the, you know, not only the computing and, and infrastructure resources, but also administrative resources in terms of the procedures for requesting and granting access to data and so forth. Uh, and then finally, um, everyone, I mean, the, he always established based on congressional mandate and everyone, as you know, if you've been following the opioid crisis, which got worse during COVID, uh, is uh, very keen on the most rapid progress possible. Um, and so the idea is that rapid sharing and collaboration uh, can, can improve that. So um, I realize this one slide, uh, so Bob mentioned sort of the difference between the use of mesh and ecosystem. And um, there is a thing called the HEAL data ecosystem and the HEAL platform, which I'm talking about today, really is part of that. The HEAL data ecosystem is a little bit different from, from the synonymous use of, of ecosystem with mesh. Uh, but as you can see, I mentioned, uh, more than 800 different studies who are all submitting their data and metadata to over 20, really almost two dozen uh, NIH repositories and other repositories um, for sharing. The HEAL platform interoperates with those repositories uh, and not only aggregates and provides searchable access to the metadata for those studies, uh, but then also uh, access to the data, uh, either open data or uh, for approved users so that they may either download those data or compute over them within a platform workspace, a Gen 3 workspace. So briefly, this is what the splash page of the HEAL data platform looks like today. Um, uh, we essentially started by harvesting the metadata for HEAL-funded studies from NIH Reporter. Um, we then have a process, which I'll say just a bit more in a, about in a moment, whereby individual HEAL investigators register their studies on the platform. This is before their data are accessible or even submitted to a repository. The HEAL platform aggregates additional study-level metadata from sources like clinicaltrials.gov and when uh, available through individual repositories. Um, and then I'm going to say a little bit more about this. Um, uh, uh, the HEAL platform also has made a serious effort to uh, solicit, uh, collect, and organize metadata from these studies well in advance of their data becoming available. And this may be a bit unique for a data mesh, but it's entirely intended uh, to um, provide search and discovery as soon as possible and sort of to catalyze very early uh, collab opportunities for collaboration. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, the Hill platform has Gen 3 workspaces, um, and we are now in the process of uh, establishing interoperability with the aforementioned repositories. I just want to say a little bit about the metadata here, um, uh, because this has stimulated some development uh, uh, into, into uh, features which ultimately will become more generally available through Gen 3. Uh, these are to accommodate both study level metadata so these are descriptions of, uh, uh, you know, a study and its properties, uh, and then also variable level metadata. Um, and so as part of our project uh, to build the HEAL platform, uh, we've created some tooling both within Gen 3 and then in the form of external tools that work inside uh, common packages like Stata and R and so forth to generate these metadata from existing files, from uh, uh, data collection instruments like REDCap and so forth, uh, and then to manage and ultimately utilize uh, these metadata. And so this is something that's, that's really exciting and, and of considerable value, not only in the context of a data mesh, uh, but also, as I said, just for a, an individual data commons. Um, and I think this slide is is simply um, 
emphasizing the fact that there are a number of workflows for investigators creating these metadata, submitting them, uh, and then updating them, and then and then ultimately fetching them and working with them uh, that we have sort of built around the built-in Gen 3 capabilities for this. Um, now, uh, as I mentioned before, the repositories that HEAL investigators will be submitting their data to uh, really have tremendous, uh, really very considerably. Um, uh, they represent different disciplines and cultures. So, you know, maybe on, on one side of the space, you might have something like the dbGaP database for genotypes and phenotypes. On another side of the space, you might have something like the Syracuse Qualitative Data Repository and everything in between. Um, uh, the data uh, uh, at these different repositories have different degrees of openness and different mechanisms for requesting and approving access to those data. Um, they really vary considerably in their API capabilities, all the way from absolutely no API capabilities at all to some that are well on their way to developing a pretty capable API. Uh, and then finally, um, even just their exposure to the idea of interoperability. You know, data, data repositories really 30 years ago were made as, I mean, this was really an exercise in castle building. And that was important because the most important thing was to keep the data safe. And so, you know, and you had no reason not to stay in your castle, but now things have changed considerably. And, you know, based on a number of, of, of factors, you know, some repositories you'll see, they really are, are well uh, um, uh, familiar with the idea of a federated data system and are very keen to begin adopting some of those practices and then others for whom it's, it's going to take some some effort, uh, and that's what we're engaged in at the moment. Now, uh, the point, key point I want to leave you with, with these last couple of slides uh, is that, you know, I, I expect that everybody on this call is, is well familiar with Gen 3's microservice architecture, uh, its openness and adherence to standards. And what really was required, there was no other way to do what we're doing uh, for the HEAL platform, data platform, uh, was, was to utilize, to harness the kind of flexibility uh, that that architecture provides. So now what I'm going to show are three sort of different um, examples of how uh, repositories receiving HEAL data um, can interoperate with the HEAL data platform. Uh, the, these are not these are not necessarily 100% comprehensive, but they definitely capture uh, most of the major use cases. The first uh, is pretty close to uh, the diagram that Bob showed earlier, where you have a data repository, could be a data commons, uh, with a fully capable API. Uh, the API can handle uh, authentication and authorization and can provide both metadata and access to data sets. And so as you can see here, um, on the right, uh, the data repository is functioning inside of its own security boundary. We have the um, uh, uh, HEAL data platform on the left, um, and all of the uh, interaction is going, is going on through those APIs. One thing I'll point out to you here uh, is, um, partly as a function of, of NIH's mandate here, um, we are not handling at all any of the data governance or uh, data um, uh, uh, approval uh, and so forth procedure. Um, in the cases where a user is attempting to access restricted data or data that requires approval, they are redirected over to the local repository to request and receive that approval. And then once they've received that, then they can go back to the mesh and use it, uh, uh, or go back to the, to the data platform. You would not have to build a mesh this way, obviously. Uh, there are other models that you could follow, but this allows us to basically offload this. But a, a better way to describe that is to make use of uh, what essentially is our, our very well-developed procedures at a lot of the repositories. Um, so, so as I said, this works very well for a repository that has a fully capable API, um, or 
has completely open access data, but provides through their API access to metadata and data. The second example is one in which the repository basically takes uh, some uh, Gen 3 FAIR services and runs them under their control within their own security environment. And those then provide uh, the API endpoints that are required to build the mesh. And you can do this, you can sort of mix and match on here. So the example that I've given here, uh, we're making use of an existing API for metadata, but the repository is running Gen 3 services for authentication, authorization, and, uh, and data indexing. Um, and so as those of you who are already used to running uh, part or all of the Gen 3 stack, uh, those are, are very modular, uh, straightforward to set up, um, and, uh, and of course, freely accessible. So um, this allows us basically to achieve from the user's perspective, the data user's perspective, exactly the same thing. Uh, but this is much better suited for repositories that may only have a partially functional API, as you see here in this example, or those that don't have an API but are planning to develop one. And a lot of NIH repositories are precisely in that boat right now. They're just on different parts of the arc, their development arc there. Or finally, repositories that may not have any current plans to develop an API, but are simply interested in trying out a few uh, Gen 3 components. Um, and because those are relatively lightweight and relatively easy to set up, relying on standards and so forth, um, you know, a lot of places have uh, have uh, um, uh, sysadmins and so forth who are capable of doing that. Now, this third example is, is a bit different. Um, uh, and this is really intended for repositories that don't have an API, um, are not particularly looking to develop one, and don't even really have the resources to manage additional uh, services within their, uh, within their boundary. And so in this case, um, there's a cloud bucket that managed cloud bucket that contains the data. So that's just like before, and that resides in inside the boundary. So the repository is still responsible for managing the data long term, the fidelity of the data. Uh, but what you, you, you see here is that um, we're utilizing uh, an existing Gen 3 um, uh, service, uh, its requester service, together with a few of its other services, to essentially provide an API that the repository can use to manage access to the data, which once again reside and are, uh, are uh, uh, under their own control. And again, this is a flexible sort of setup. You can do this in, in different ways. But uh, in sum, what these three examples show is that, you know, across the panoply of, uh, of repositories, almost two dozen of them that are part of the HEAL initiative, and, and I should also say, by the way, that include very, very big repositories within NIH. So these are not HEAL only repositories, but many of them have quite a bit of data. In other words, when we're done with this, this is going to cover, um, oh gosh, I, I'm not sure, but a, a substantial amount of the repository, the NIH repository and, and biomedical research repository landscape. Um, uh, Gen 3 really allows you to, to put these together in a way where you can meet the repositories where they, were, where, where they are. Um, and uh, while we had a mandate from NIH to build this system, we absolutely did not have one to compel the repositories to interoperate with us. Um, and so this essentially making a setup like this work requires absolutely being able to present each repository with, uh, with a, a, a kind of approach that they feel comfortable with and that they can work with on a technical level and that they can grow and involve with as Gen 3 evolves and as the repositories pursue their own development paths. I guess I'll stop there then. And I'm glad to take questions uh, later, whenever is the appropriate time. Yeah, let's um, 
uh, hold questions until the end. We're just a couple minutes running behind now. So we'll, um, Faye, if you could share again, we'll um, start with RT on the BRH. Awesome. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Arti Venkat. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago and the scientific lead for the Biomedical Research Hub, or BRH. I work at the Center for Translational Data Science with Bob and team. And today, I'm very excited to talk to you about BRH, which is one of the few data meshes we are building at the center. Next slide, please. So CTDS has built 19 different data commons spanning more than a million patients. And this raises the question of how to search and discover effectively across multiple data commons. So this is similar to Bob's, you know, what Bob presented earlier. And that's our big motivation here. BRH is built for this purpose. Next slide, please. So this figure is adapted from Craig Barnes' paper on Biomedical Research Hub, which came out in 2021. BRH interoperates with other data commons using framework services, as you have heard uh, Bob and Phil talk about before. And framework services are shown in the bottom layer of this slide. So these include services for authentication and authorization, indexing services, which allow you to generate persistent identifiers for the data, and services for accessing data. So BRH assumes that there are APIs that are enabled for metadata, which enables metadata to be imported into the mesh, and also API for the data so that users can construct GraphQL queries and import data into the mesh. There are also additional services such as the workspace token service, which is not shown here, but we've recently worked on that and introduced it into the mesh to aggregate authorization information from different connected data commons. The middle layer in this figure shows that BRH is a federated data mesh in the sense that it's a collection of independent data commons or data resources that can be explored and analyzed in a single unified data portal, which we call the BRH discovery page. Each data commons can set up its own governance structure and agreements as Bob mentioned before, and the mesh can work with that. Analysis workspaces and notebooks, which are shown on the topmost layer, they are built on top of the framework services for accessing and analyzing data from one or more connected data commons. Next slide, please. So BRH interoperates with multiple data commons as shown in the image here. So this is the screenshot of the discovery page of BRH. And it has a little drop down of connected commons. And you can see that various commons from the cancer research data commons, such as genomic data commons, proteomic data commons, imaging data commons, biodata catalyst, and several others are currently connected. So this says that the mesh spans a vast range of study types and data. Some examples include imaging, transcriptomics, single cell data, proteomics, genetics, genomics, dem demographics, and public records. So this makes BRH an invaluable resource for discovering and doing joint analyses across one or more of the connected commons. Next slide, please. So the platform itself has several special features, and I'll go over some of them now. It has a searchable discovery page which supports simple keyword searches. Example, if you type in the word Framingham, you'll see that it retrieves six relevant studies, which describe the Framingham cohort studies and others. It has an inbuilt data access method, which shows you how a researcher can access data from the project. So that could be either API, or you could download it from the manifest, and the manifest itself describes several data files that the user can import into their compute workspace, or they could also download single files or single persistent identifiers using the Gen3 SDK. There is also a data availability padlock, which shows for each user what they have and don't have access to. Next slide, please. Compute workspaces are available through the workspace tab for analyzing data from any of the connected commons. Both open access and controlled access data can be analyzed. Workspaces can be spun up using AWS strides 
or a newly introduced direct pay feature which supports credit card in integration. Direct pay is a brand new feature that we have just recently introduced and it is currently in beta testing. Direct pay is a collaboration between Open Commons Consortium and the BRH team at CTDS. We are very excited about direct pay and Plumman is also joining us today. So thanks very much to Plumman and his team for working with us on this. Next slide. Next slide. Users can also track their spending limits under account information, and this is hugely valuable. So user can see under the account information dropdown what charges have accrued in their workspace and what their spending limits are. So this allows them to manage and renew funds accordingly. Next slide, please. The aggregate metadata service or AgMDS is a special feature of the mesh. It caches metadata from two or more metadata sources to provide a unified view of the comments on the discovery page. AgMDS uses adapters, which is a piece of code that queries the metadata service of the individual data comments, such as GDC, PDC, or IDC, using APIs, aggregates them, and loads them in an elastic search cache for fast discovery and analysis. Next slide, please. So how can they, I think there's a slide before this, which is just a question on Ag MDS. Uh, so how can the Ag MDS be updated to add or delete a data commons? Adding and deleting data commons in the Ag MDS is very easy to do. I've made a little video on this that demonstrates how the Ag MDS can be updated and an additional data comments added to the mesh. Sai will be delving later into the technical details and he'll show the video when I hand it over to him. Next slide, please. BRH also has several other special features. As I mentioned before, one feature is to correctly determine what a user has and does not have access to. It does this using a workspace token service. Next slide, please. A user can link several accounts from external data resources in BRH through the profile page. So workspace token service then aggregates authorization information from the connected comments to correctly display what a user has and does not have access to. So later in this presentation, Sai will explain how this works. And I think now is maybe a good time to go into the technical uh, dive down into some of these features. So I'm going to hand over the presentation to Sai and hope you enjoyed this whirlwind tour about BRH. Faye, uh, is it possible for me to share my screen? I think you should be able to. Thank you. Is it is it visible? Yes. Awesome. Thanks. Hello, everybody. My name is Sai Sai Shanmukhan Arumanshi, and I'm a software developer here at Center for Translational Data Science. And I'm going to talk about how to set up a data mesh. Uh, let me first begin with uh, common differences between data commons and data meshes in terms of technicality. And then I'll delve deep into other topics. So data meshes are like a collection of multiple data commons in a single a single environment. Even though they are similar, to, they're different from data. I mean, data meshes are different from data commons. They have some basic framework services that are common between both of them. Like for example, they use Fence for authentication and authorization purposes. They use Arborist for as a policy engine. And Windmill or Data Portal is the front-end interactive website that we have. And there are also a few other additional services that, uh, that are present in Data Mesh that will allow us to interact with other data commons. Let me talk about some key features of Data Meshes. So for a Data Mesh, we need uh, three main features. One is to be able to fetch metadata from other connected data commons. And the second one is to access appropriate studies. And the third one is to provide authorization to connected commons, to be able to provide authorization to multiple connected commons. Let me begin with ag aggregate metadata sync. 
aggregate metadata sync or aggregate metadata service is an extension to the metadata service api and it allows fetching aggregated metadata from multiple data multiple metadata service instances so we do it using an, a sync job called agmds sync job and what it basically does is it tries to copy metadata from multiple data commons and store it in a single data store. More information about the documentation of IMDS sync job is provided at the, at the link below. Uh, metadata service is extended uh, with a new endpoint called slash aggregate endpoint, and it has several uh, features, which, which uh, the API endpoint is mentioned here in the documentation below. Uh, in order to uh, get, uh, in order to run aggregate metadata service or Ag IMDS sync job, uh, it depends on a JSON-based configuration file, and that configuration file basically defines a few important information like where to get the data from and what data adapters to use, and a few other fields like field mappings that talks about how to normalize data fields and other fields. Now, a detailed demo about how to use this configuration is given by RT, and that will be in a video that, I that I'll show shortly. And more information is available in the documentation below. And ultimately, there is a Gen3 adapter, Gen3 data adapter that, that handles uh, fetching metadata, for, metadata from multiple Gen3 instances. But if there is a requirement of fetching data from multiple, a different data source, uh, one can always write a custom data adapter and the documentation about how to do it is linked below in the in the slide. Now let me go ahead and show the demo that RT has made. This is QABRH, the environment for testing and development. You see there is a data commons dropdown. We have several data commons connected in QA. Let's say I want to add an additional data commons and have it show up in the dropdown here. So for this exercise, we'll go with the Gen3 open access data commons, which is running in this URL, gen3.datacommons.io. So the first thing I'll do is SSH to QABRH. So I've already SSH'd into this environment. Let's take a look at the files. You see that there is a manifest.json and several other relevant directories, manifest, metadata, portal. Let's open manifest.json. So you'll see in manifest.json, there are the versions of the microservices that we are running. And uh, this is our QA environment, so we updated it to uh, the April versions. So the important variable that you need to look at is this use aggregate metadata service and the AgMDS namespace. So for a mesh, the use AgMDS variable should be set to true, which enables the aggregate metadata service. And the AgMDS namespace is typically set to whichever environment you're working in. So for QA, this is set to QA BRH. Similarly, you'll have set different namespaces for staging and prod. And this is so the testing and development can be separated in these namespaces. So, uh, so that's the first thing. The next thing is let's take a look at where the AgMDS config itself is. So the config itself lives in the metadata directory. So you'll see there's an aggregate config.json. So let's take a look at the aggregate config JSON. You'll see that there is a schema that's defined here uh, with uh, some common variables like study ID, URL, project ID, short name, full name. And each data commons has its own dictionary here. So for example, IBD has its, uh, has its own definition and you'll see there is an MDS URL for the metadata service. Uh, the comments name and one really important thing to note here is the field mappings so the field mappings are where some harmonization is happening so it tries to map the variables from the study to consistent terminology and this actually enables some level of harmonization in the mesh 
you'll see that every comment shares you know the same field mappings so we try to keep it as consistent as possible and then it's easy to power the brh discovery page based on these mappings so let's go to the end of this file and we want to add an additional entry for oadc so for this exercise i already have uh, the json blob in a different document so i'm just going to copy and paste that here and let's go ahead and just remove this extra comma and save this. Okay, so let's confirm that OADC indeed shows up. Yes, so this is the last data comments that we added. So now that we have added it, now we need to run an aggregate metadata sync job. So there are actually multiple ways to do this. You can either run a command called populate, which is in our metadata service repository, or you can just run the gen3 job run metadata aggregate sync. So let's just go ahead and run the gen3 job for metadata aggregate sync. First thing you need to do is run a gen3 cube setup secrets. So uh, what this does is, what Cube Setup Secrets does is, it'll take your uh, updated, you know, the local changes to the aggregate config.json, and uh, it will make sure that the aggregate metadata sync job takes that updated file, right? So you just want to update the secrets to take that uh, updated config. So this will take a few minutes to run. So let's wait for that. So this has completed. Now let's go ahead and run our Gen3 job run. Metadata aggregate sync. So what this will do is this will now update the Ag MDS with OADC. So you'll see that the job has started. So if you want to look at what pods are initialized, you can do kubectl get pods. And you'll see that there is a new pod created for metadata aggregate sync, and it's currently initializing. This will take a few minutes for uh, the pod to initialize, the job to run and complete. So let's give this a few minutes and check the status of this job. Okay, let's check the status of the pod again. So let's just look for the metadata aggregate sync. So this has completed. So now that our Ag MDS job has completed, all we need to do is go back to our QABRH discovery page and refresh this. So let's refresh this and check if OADC has come up. So you can see the number of studies has gone up from 516 to 520. And in our data commons dropdown, you see that there is open access data common. So that's all that there is to it. Similarly, deletion of our data comments is really simple. You just delete that dictionary entry from your config, just run cube setup secrets and uh, aggregate metadata sync job, and you should be good to go. Thanks so much. All right, that, that is a demo of how to put on ag aggregate metadata sync. And this is uh, a screenshot of the discovery page with all the aggregate metadata that is required. The next topic that I want to talk about is token service or uh, workspace token service. Now this service allows us to uh, properly authenticate users and identify which users have access to what studies. Uh, before I go into uh, the slides, I, I, I've made a small video that can explain about this with, along with the demo. Let me go ahead and play that. Hello. My name is Sai Narumanshi, and this is a small demo on how to connect additional data commons to a data mesh. In this example, we would be connecting QABRH, which is a data mesh, to an environment called QAJCoin, which is a data commons. Now, for the first step, we need to go ahead into appgrads.json file 
and may verify whether the external OIDC field exists or not. So this is the appgrids.json file which is present in Gen3 Secrets, G3 Auto, WTS folder in your QABRH or data mesh VM. And this is the external OIDC field that I'm talking about. This file is auto-generated once you set up WTS using cube setup WTS command. Now, the next step that we have here is to create this WTS as a fence client in other commons' fence. In our case, we want to create a fence client in QA JCoin. And the way we do it is to SSH into QA JCoin's VM and run the following command. kubectl exec8 gentrypod fence dash dash bash. Now this will allow us into the fence container in the QA JCoin environment. Within this fence container, we can run the fence create client create command to create a client. Fence create client create dash dash client name of the client. I have named the client as WTS dash QA dash PRH dash dash URLs and this is the URL that we are supposed to give and dash dash username with a username of choice. This command would return us a client ID and a client secret. Once we have our client ID and client secret from QA JCoin, let us go back to QA BRH and fill in this field of external OIDC. We need to paste a JSON object with the following fields. Base URL, this would be the base URL of the QA environment that we are trying to connect to or a data commons that we are trying to connect to. OIDC client ID, this would be the client ID that we just got from this command. I'm going to copy this and paste it here. Client secret or OIDC client secret would be the client secret that we just received. And then this is the login options field and we, we can have as many login options that are support that we have in the QA JCoin environment. In this case, we are choosing IDP or identity provider as Google. Therefore, we name, we give a name to this login option. Just a heads up, like if we are having multiple OIDC clients connected, this particular login options field must be unique across all the fields. So if I have QA JCoin Google here, I have to make sure I don't have any other QA JCoin Googles in this particular external OIDC configuration okay and within this login options I would give the name this would be the name that will be appeared in the data portal in, in the form of a button and then params we would have the IDP param and I'm, I'm going to say Google because I'm going to have Google as the identity provider so this is the basic external OIDC configuration block I'm going to save it and run the following command in the first terminal window, we have this command, Gen3 cube setup secrets and Gen3 cube setup WTS. What this does is updates all the configuration files according to the latest secrets values and runs Gen3 cube setup WTS. Now, on the right side, I usually place a window which would just give me the current status of the pod, which I can use to understand whether this pod has been restarted or not. So when we open the profile page in QABRH's data portal, we see that there are no connected commons right now. We can also go in to the base URL of QABRH slash WTS slash external OIDC to get a response of all the connected commons. And we currently see there is nothing because we haven't connected any commons so far. Okay, now the command has been executed and we see that a new WTS part has been initialized. Now if we go back to the data portal and refresh this page, Now we can see QA JCoin as one of the available options for data commons to connect to. And if we refresh this external OIDC, we would see this JSON object as the response. Now any user who is logged in to QABRH can authorize QA JCoin by clicking this button and going through the Google login of QA JCoin. Now look at this. So we see authorize WTS QA BRH, that is the name that we have given to our Gen3 client, to access the following options. And thus we have connected QA JCoin to QA BRH. This expires in 29 days. The second use case for which we can use WTS is the slash aggregate endpoint. When we have multiple commons connected to our data mesh, we also need to identify which studies or data objects that the user has access to.
based on the access control policies that are assigned to him in the connected data commons. We can achieve this by fetching the response from the OTZ mapping field from each of the connected data commons. In order to do that, we make use of the slash aggregate endpoint present in WTS. In order to achieve it, the first step we need to do is to get into appcredits.json and verify whether this field exists, aggregate endpoint allowed list. And within this list, we need to add the endpoint which we want to access from each of the end data commons. Now, once this particular endpoint is added, we need to set up secrets and run WTS again. And once this action is performed, we would be able to hit slash WTS slash aggregate slash OTZ slash mapping in our data mesh to fetch all the OTZ mappings of connected data comms. If we try to access the endpoint directly before adding it to the configuration, we would see a response saying that this endpoint is not configured in the aggregate endpoint allowed list. So WTS would only be able to fetch those endpoints that are configured in the aggregate endpoint allowed list. All right. So the new WTS pod has been initialized and this particular change of having slash or the slash mapping in the allow list has been reflected. Now if we go into QABRH's slash aggregate slash or the slash mapping and refresh this page, we would see an aggregate response from both QABRH and JCoin's or the mapping. Now in order to verify this, I have also opened JCoin, QA JCoin on the other side and we can view the response of slash or the slash mapping. So this is the response of slash or the slash mapping for this particular user in QA JCoin. And we would get the same as an aggregate response in case of QA BRH when we try to use the slash aggregate endpoint of WTS. So that is the second use case of WTS in QA BRH or in a data mesh in general. Thank you. So that sums up the two use cases of uh, having WTS and also uh, how to set up metadata aggregate service. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Sai. Um, hey, could you just bring up that acknowledgement um, slide? Okay, I just wanted to, before we took it over to um, uh, questions, I just wanted to thank, we'll flip this around, thank the speakers. Oh. Lost the um, slide there briefly. I wanted to thank the speakers, um, Bob, Phil, Archie, and Sai, and then also um, the Gen3 Forum Steering Committee to help in organizing these. So that includes Bob, Stephen Manos of the Australian Biocommons, Claire Rye of the New Zealand eScience Infrastructure, Armin Martinov of the Open Commons Consortium, and myself. So. Um, Thanks to everybody. And um, we're going to turn this over to questions now. So um, please type your questions in chat um, or raise your hand and we'll um, call on you to, to unmute. I think there's enough people here that it might be better to do it that way. Um, I can look in the chat here. I think there's one question I saw that hasn't yet been addressed. Um, so people are excited about the demos, um, but they're asking, um, is there an MDS demo instead of the Ag MDS demo? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I was taking a quick look through the um, online um, documentation. Um, RT, do you have any insight into that or, or anybody on the, on the call that might be from the center if there's any existing documentation? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not aware of a separate demo for MDS. I mean, it may be part of how to bring up, you know, how to stand up your own Gen 3 data commons, which involves getting all these microservices up and running. Uh, so yeah, I, I could check to see, you know, if it's part of that, otherwise, you know, happy to make one. Also, the user services team may probably know, Faye may probably know if there's a demo like this already. I don't think we have a demo, but there is a um, recording um, and I'll have to get the URL for it on our metadata services that was done for the uh, CRDC, the Cancer Research Data Commons, last spring. So let me grab that uh, link to the video. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Faye. Um, OK. 
Okay, are there any other questions from the audience? Um, we had a lot of material, um, both on, you know, conceptually and on the details of um, spinning up a mesh. Um, okay, Alex is adding some information. Um, I guess if there's no questions, maybe I'll just ask one. Um, uh, I think it's for Archie, I guess, but it could be for, for Bob as well. Um, I was wondering what's, you know, are there other commons on, on the horizon for, for BRH that um, you're planning to add? Yeah, what an exciting, NIHS, yay. And <laughs> Michael, yeah, you know, we, yeah. So that's, that's one comments we are excited about. So we are working on, and I see Mike Conway is here too. Yeah, so that's going to be our, our next job. Great, yes. Um, yeah, we're excited to add that as a new, um, a new comment into BRH. Um, here, um, I guess any of the speakers, did you have any, um, thoughts or, or, or questions about um, about meshes, um, maybe plans for the future? It, we're going to make it in the roadmap, we're planning to make it more easier and easier to add commons to meshes. So we're trying to really reduce the time it's required to do that. Um, Michael, at the end of the questions, we should have a brief discussion on, you know, what topics people want for the next forum. Um, but I think that the main thing is um, we really want to make it easier for, it's you know, presumably it's easier with the helm charts, though I don't know the details, to bring up a mesh than it used to be. And so organizations that are running separate commons may want to run these as a mesh or may not want to. It's up to you. But um, we're just trying to make it easier to do this. Um, I guess I'd ask the same question for um, Bill as I asked for BRH um, for Heal. Are there um, uh, other data sources that are um, will be added in the in the future? Well, no, it, that's a reasonable question. Um, uh, we have the the repositories that I mentioned. Um, all of which were identified because they're expected to receive uh, at least some data from heal funded studies. But for example, um, there are a number of states that have developed um, dashboards and data aggregation services to try and provide more timely access, sort of real time access to, to administrative data collected at the level of the state. And so that's one of the things that we're actually looking into uh, being able to integrate within the Heal data platform. Uh, those, at least a couple of them, uh, were created self-consciously to, to have capable APIs. So that makes them a little bit easier. But, um, uh, and then the other thing that I, I might mention, as long as I just have the floor briefly, is, um, you know, the whole idea of data meshes um, raises a whole bunch of interesting questions when it comes to um, both reproducible research, um, you know, uh, the way in which you, the way in which you cite uh, where your data came from and provide, you know, multiple places where they can be gotten in the future for people who are wanting to replicate your results. Um, and also for the way in which you think about data portability. So it's entirely possible to imagine a data mesh where, uh, the individual repositories that the mesh is built on top of themselves may change over time and data may shift from one to another uh, and so forth. Um, and so obviously the wonderful thing about the data mesh is in principle for the data consumer, for the user, um, you know, that's a level of abstraction above those details. And so, you know, in the ideal world, they don't even have to know that those things are happening. However, um, uh, you know, it, it, there are, are interesting examples to consider. And as I mentioned, data portability, um, both from a sustainability perspective, but also, you know, ensuring that you're creating data packages so that they can be analyzed in one environment as easily as they're analyzed in another. They can move between them and so forth. Um, uh, this, I think, is, is a very interesting 
sort of area that we will be spending a fair amount of, we already have but we'll be continuing to spend a fair amount of time with and heal um i i should have emphasized um phil thank you and thank you to all the speakers you know one thing that comes for free in the mesh is you could bring up uh, uh, essentially trivially uh, um uh with fence and index D in the metadata service, a, a, a data lake that would be accessible, accessible to everyone in the ecosystem. And so um, it would be under the hybrid governance, under the security and compliance, but it would be very easy to bring up a, a, a central data lake, which is you know a, a central data lake with, um, uh, with um, individual commons sort of around it um, is sort of an architecture a lot of people like. So that that is a special case we may want to highlight in the future in one in, in one of these presentations. No real work is required. It comes for free with with the Gen 3 and the current architecture. So you might want to keep that in mind. Um, it's related to some of the things Phil was doing with basically uh, uh, these um, these services around individual repositories that may not have it. But you can sort of um, use Gen three in this way to make uh, data more fair for your ecosystem if you're bringing in uh, older resources that might not have fair APIs. Yeah, thanks, um, Phil and Bob. Um, just following along in the chat here. Um, thanks, Alex, for posting a link. Thanks also to Faye for posting the link on the metadata service. Um, Mike Conway was asking about adapters, which um, RT pro provided um, some in, uh, documentation on. Um, RT, do you want to say anything else about how these adapters work or what their purpose is? Yeah, so this documentation actually, yeah, so thanks to Craig, we have this really cool documentation, you know, showing you it should be pretty straightforward to connect, you know, a, a new repository and get metadata from. So you can write your own class for it, which is at the end of this documentation. Uh, or or you can just take a look at, so there's this class remote metadata adapter you could write. If you want to write a new adapter, or you could just look at, you know, the configuration we have and, and use it. So it, it is fairly flexible. All right, and um, not to just keep picking on RT, but um, there's another question uh, about the the user pays workspaces. Um, do you, can you give a few more details about what's envisioned there? Yeah, so that's something that we've been doing, you know, working on recently. So there were uh, there's this initiative that I mentioned in my talk called Direct Pay, where uh, you know this uh, user can use a credit card model, you know, so they can pay pay for the usage using credit card, and that's something that we've been working with OCC on. And Plumman is here. Hi, Plumman. Do you want to add a few few sentences? <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, definitely. So you have an option to either use a credit card uh, to add additional funds. So you could do continue the research or you could ultimately do an invoice. So this is part of the Open Commons Consortium and the partnership with the Center for Translation Data Sciences, where we can ultimately enable further research through different payment models. Yeah, so that's one, or you can use our very own strides model, you know, which is always available. You just have to apply for access, you know, strides credits or strides grants, and then you can spin up workspace using that. Thanks, RT and Plamen. Um, okay, before uh, we turn it over to topics for the next uh, meeting, do, do the speakers or the steering committee um, have any other thoughts they wanna share about data meshes? All right, so then let's turn it over to um, topics that the community would like to see um, in future meetings. So as Bob said, we're we're trying to do one of these every other month, um, and the model is generally we want to very closely collaborate with um, other groups or, that are creating or have created a Gen 3 data commons. So. Um, that's that's typically the, the model we're looking for. So we really want to 
include others' um, presentations as part of these um, events. I'm sure uh, I'm sure people have some ideas. I know we've um we have talked um about having a broader discussion about um security and compliance. Um so that that could be a a topic if if people think that would be of interest. So beyond just, you know, standing up a Gen 3 Commons, if people have use cases for um, you know operating and maintaining a Gen 3 Commons, which includes security and compliance. So um, that had been a discussion. We've also discussed ideas around diving into, uh, you know, these microservices in more detail. So if people wanted, you know, much more topic on uh, fence, uh, you know, authorization, authentication, or much more topic on data indexing or the metadata service. Um, so those are all options if um you know people are are interested in that would people be interested in it it can be complicated to do the front end maybe we could talk a little bit about the front end and give a preview of what's happening with the front end framework uh if people are interested in that just let us know if you're interested in that yeah and just to say more on that you can um Certainly, feel free to reach out um, to the to the group with ideas after today. You don't have to um, necessarily um, contribute your ideas right now. I, I would say the front end is a, a very interesting idea, specifically around the exploration page and being able to showcase different data sets once you have normalized and harmonized them. I've seen from my perspective quite a few organizations wanting to do that. So I'm going to speak for a few <laughs> and say that I think that's a really great idea. And uh, there's a, a positive comment from Claire uh, also. Well, um, I it, it sounds like this is Wandy down. I want to thank everyone. Um, um, all the materials we put on the um, on the web. Um, I want to thank the speakers, but I also want to uh, particularly thank you know the wonderful video from Sai and from um, Artie. You know these videos just make it easier for the community to um, uh, to um, uh, you know um, use Gen three and build commons and uh, workspaces and um, ecosystems and. You know, if um, any of the people on the phone create videos, you know, just send them to us and we'll um, link to them. You know, we really want to make it easier for this community to, 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 to grow. So uh, thanks to everyone who prepared materials, um, you know, and um, uh, I, 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 there was a, a fair amount of technical material presented, including um, some of the ways the governance issues that and security issues that Phil described when you add commons to um, and repositories to meshes, which um, can be a little complicated to work out. Um, but there, there's some templates um, that have been prepared uh, to facilitate doing this for um, HEAL that may be useful for others. So, um, you know, um, once again, thanks. And Let's give people a break between uh, bef between uh, before their next meeting. So um, we'll see you see you in six to eight weeks. And um, you know, um, uh, uh, thanks again for being part of this community. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right, bye guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, guys.